All right, so we're continuing the series of Pirkei Avot that we started several weeks ago, and we're holding Mishnah Zayim. As I've explained in the past, it appears at least sometimes that the Mishnayot have some connection, some sequence, even though we're talking about a different generation. We're talking about the next pair or the next group of rabbis who are giving us valuable lessons there's some connection, there's a certain order between the Mishnayot. The last Mishnah that we covered spoke about the importance of acquiring or having a friend, a rabbi, to seek, uh, to seek advice, to consult with, to judge people favorably, how important it is to be around good people. Mishnah Zayn, Nitai Harbeli, who is the second rabbi in the group, in despair, Yeshua ben Prachia ben Itai Harbeli Kiblubin. So last week's Mishnah was Yeshua ben Prachia's advice to us, the importance of having good friends, the importance of judging people favorably, looking at them positively, that we should not be suspicious or think negatively of everyone. Otherwise, we won't have friends. So he spoke about the importance of friendship and looking at people positively from his angle. Now we're going to look at the things from a different angle completely. And that is Nitai Harbeli Omer. Even though it's true, in other words, he agrees with what was said before, that one should have friends, one should, should judge people favorably. He tells us, beware. Beware of friends, beware of people. Harhek Mishachen Ra. Number one, he says, stay away from bad neighbors. So it's important that we be mitayek, that we actually pay attention to the words that are being chosen here. Stay away, stay away. Keep a distance mishachen ra, from a bad neighbor. But when it comes to a wicked person, not a bad person, wicked is different. Ve'altit chaber rasha, don't associate with a wicked person. He does not say stay away, keep a distance from a wicked person. People misunderstand what the word rasha means. There's different levels of rasha'im. Wicked does not mean bad. A person could be generous, he could be charitable. He's not bad to be, he doesn't hurt anybody. But he's a rasha. He's a wicked person. A wicked person means that he does not follow the Torah. He does not do things according to the Torah. Even certain things, other things he does well, he's still called a rasha. Because it, it appears to be a little bit confusing here. You know, on the one hand, we're told to stay away, mishachen ra. But a rasha, we would think rasha is worse. No, a person who's ra, ra is bad. Bad person, really bad. Stay away from him, but don't associate with a rasha, with a wicked person. A person who's not, who does not do things honestly, perhaps. In, when it comes to business, or he does things not right. He, he, maybe he's not such a bad person. Don't associate with him. And number three, Altitya Ishmina Puranut. We're going to explain each one separately. Don't give up hope on retribution. That's the literal translation of the word Puranut. Puranut means retribution. It is one of the principles in Judaism that we believe in Sakhar Va'onish and reward and punishment for one's ma'asim. And as you know, that reward and punishment as much as it is important, it's an important principle, it is a little bit concealed. Concealed because we don't really see always in our lifetime the retribution, the punishment for evil deeds. People did something terrible. Oh, we feel he should get something for that. He should be punished for it. Yeah, of course he should. And he will. Unless he fixes it, unless he corrects it through Teshuvah. But when will that happen? If later on in his life, or if in Olam Abba in the world to come, which is most of the time when he gets it. <laughs> we don't know. So al means don't give up hope in thinking that just because you do not witness it, you don't see it, and it appears that the Rishayim are getting away with it, don't think it's not going to happen. It eventually will. That's the literal meaning, but we have to, under, we have to explain every point over here. Nitai Harbeli his main emphasis over here is on proper education, raising one's children, living in the right environment, being careful not to cultivate the relationship of bad people or being around 
uh, elements in society that can really ruin our life in many ways. That's what he's, he's concerned with. He says, ultimately, even if you have good friends, even if you have a good chinook, you've had a great upbringing in a good home, a healthy home, and you have a good wife too, everything fine. Imagine, he says, all of that can go down the drain, all of that can be lost if you have bad influences, if you're around bad people. Being around bad people can spoil, can ruin people. Very simple. In the same way that good, goodness, as it was pointed out by Yeshua ben Prakia, in the same way that a, a good influence may elevate you, may help you, may guide you in the right path, bad influences can bring someone down. What's the reason for it? The reason behind the words over here are very simple. The Taihar Beli is pointing out what the Rambam actually also says and elaborates on, that society, environment, has a tremendous effect on people. Imagine how many, how many millions of dollars companies spend on pirsomot, on advertisement. Why do they do it? Because they know it helps. They know it works. It has an effect. People actually believe what they hear for some, and what they see for some reason. They're not suspicious enough. They don't investigate it enough. Some people today check out consumer reports, and even then, you don't even know who's right and who's wrong. People are affected by what they hear and see, especially if you're exposed for a long time. You're going to pick up. You're going to pick up the accent of the people. You're going to learn the language. You're going to assimilate the ways, the customs, the habits of the place where you live. That's how it is. That's how you know where somebody comes from when you listen to him talking. Oh, he has this accent. If he's been around there for a while, he's picked it up. What do you expect? A person picks up. He's like a sponge. He will pick up a lot of what is going on in his surroundings. If that's the case, let us hope he picks up something good and not something bad. Even though this individual who is in a, an environment which is not so good is himself a good person and his idea may be, well, I, wanna, I don't mind being around these people on the contrary, I will be a good influence towards them. Unfortunately, it works the other way around. The chances of being influenced in a negative way are greater than the chances of being a positive influence towards others. You, you are one, and they are many. And even if you are one and he is one, the power of evil, the power of the Tuma, in some ways, is more powerful than the Kedusha. For the Kedusha to infiltrate, for the Kedusha to penetrate, is much more difficult, requires much more effort than for Tuma to enter. The Tuma can easily enter into a home. The Tuma can easily affect a person in much, with much more ease than for the Kiddusha to be absorbed for a person to want to be holy, to want to be a good person. It's easier, therefore, to be bad than to be good. Very simple. And that was the argument that Sarah had with Abraham concerning Yishmael. Yishmael is the son of Abraham. And Sarah is telling her husband, get rid of him. Why? He's going to be, I suspect, and I fear, a bad influence over my son Yitzchak. And what does Abraham think? Listen, Yitzhak is a good boy. Maybe Yitzhak will be a good influence over Ishmael. Sarah says, no, it doesn't work like that. Listen to me, trust me, I know what I'm talking about. And Hashem says to Abraham, yes, Sarah is right, listen to what she has to say. It's dangerous. To be around bad people and to say nothing is going to happen to you, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not going to work. You can't defend yourself so easily being around the, the wrong people. Besides the fact that there is influences, bad influence coming from these people, the rabbis tell us, Oil Rasha, the Oil Shechino. Woe to the, to the Rasha, to the evil or to the wicked man. Eventually, it's going to catch up with him, his deeds. But also, Woe Lishchino, to whoever is his neighbor. If you are the neighbor, if you happen to be the neighbor of a Rasha, and his house burns down, <laughs> Guess what? The house next door may also burn down, even though it's not a Ravarasha. Just by being close. You live in a bad place and there's going to be an earthquake. There's going to be a tornado. And you just happen to be living there and you shouldn't. 
And what, what do you think? Hashem is going to just save your home? Sometimes, yes. Big tzaddik, Hashem can make miracles for. But we're not always on that level, that we can re- definitely not rely on miracles, and we can't expect it, we don't know. Rabbi just tells us, listen, you're around bad people, you can easily get hurt and share their fate. That's it. So therefore, stay, ar- stay away. Don't, don't be in that kind of a surroundings. If you know a place, a city, a community is bad, stay away from it. Don't live there. So the point is, even if it's more expensive, even if it requires more effort to look for a, a place to live, to choose a home in a better neighborhood, pay more and be in being a better neighborhood. This, of course, applies to schools as well. Many people complain how Jewish education is expensive. Yes, it is more expensive. Jewish teachers need to be paid uh, properly, accordingly. There's more expenses sometimes of when there's no government help or enough government help and they have to raise their own funds. And what can we do? You know, uh, not a, it's not always to raise funds. It's not always easy to raise funds. But we do know that if it's a good, solid Jewish education, it's the best investment a parent could make for his son. The best, the best, the best. Child spends more time in school than he does at home. As good as the parents may be, how much time do they have for him? How much attention will they give him? How much teaching will there be going on? There will be hopefully some, but depending on the kids, depending on the teachers, the Rabbanim, the Morim that one has, that's going to make a world of a difference. Whether it's kindergarten, whether it's elementary school, whether it's high school, yeshiva, all this has a tremendous powerful impact, hopefully a good impact, on the child. It's part of his upbringing. You can't be skimpy when it comes to Jewish education. You try to negotiate, of course, you do your best to get a good deal, a fair deal, according to how much you can afford it. Somehow come to an agreement with them. It's not easy, maybe, it depends on the school, but you, one has to try his best to not, to not give up on Jewish education. <laughs> how many times have I heard, I've had many calls, several, several times, where a parent tell, tells me, you know, his child is going out with a non-Jewish girl can't stop him. He says, can you allow me to guess? You probably sent your son to a public school, right? He says, yeah, how do you know, Rabbi? Well, <laughs> that's the only way it could happen. You know, he got used to, you know, living with them, uh, learning with them, being with them, playing with them, just being around them. And they're nice people, nothing wrong with them. Whether they're Koreans, whether they're uh, Muslim, Persian, regardless of where they're from. They could be good people, good-natured people, but it's the wrong, it's the wrong uh, group of people. For us, you know, it was to marry, you know, as a, as a, as a colleague in school, you know, in college or whatever, you know, they could be friendly. But marriage is off-limits. Marriage is completely off-limits for that. We have a certain mission, that we need to accomplish and we need to do with the best match possible. The best match possible is usually our soulmate, who happens to usually be Jewish, like we are. Very simple. Unless, of course, it's a genuine conversion. Genuine, sincere. There are not too many like that. So here, even though the Jewish education is more expensive, it's the one that's the most kidai. It's the one that, of course, is the, it's, they're the most qualified to give over the proper uh, chinuch to the children. And if a child does not receive that, he's risking. He's risking his future. So the Mishnah here puts emphasis on making sure that we stay around good people, the right people. Al tithaber la rasha means that even though we've learned before that a friend is important, Yes, it's, an, it's important not to acquire a good friend, to have a good relationship with someone. Just make sure that this individual is, in fact, a good person. Even though all you plan to do is going to business with him, makes no difference. If he's a rasha, you don't want to share his mazal. Remember, this man, if he's a rasha, that means his mazal at some point may be, may be completely... Uh, destroyed. In other words, it can go down. 
because he was a rasha. So you don't want to associate with that person, even if he's not such a bad guy. But, but in business dealings, if he's not honest, he doesn't do things right. He works on Shabbat. And you're going to share from the profits of that Shabbat? No, he's the one that's working. I'm not working. So what? It's all one pocket. It's one account. You won't have the beracha if you associate with such an individual. Yes? And we often speak about hidden tzaddikim, but there are also people that are hidden rashahim. How would you know? Right. That's a good question. How do you know somebody is a rasha? If the person puts on a facade? Or is right, right. Well, you have to get to know a person. And we're going to elaborate on this a little bit more as we go along. How do you get to know a person? Uh, there's, there are people who put up a facade, and it's very difficult to know. If you're married, ask your wife's opinion. Because rabbis tell us that the women have binayetera, they have a very powerful intuition when it comes to filling out people, what they're all about. Uh, but it, it requires investigation. You're going to be partners with someone, it's like a shiduk, you're about to marry someone. You've got to check them out, you got to get references. But how about if the right? guy is your name? Or Same thing. In other words, if, if he's already your neighbor, we said over here, Al, it is al haik ra. Stay away. If, you've, if he's already there, then at least al titchaber elav. Like it says, the following port, al titchaber al can also be applying to the shachen. If he's there already, and you'll move there, and he came after you, there, or, or you came afterwards, right? it makes no difference. Somehow you're living in close proximity. Al titchaber. Don't be his friend. Don't get too close to him. So, yes, when it comes to all kinds of associations with people, you have to check him out. You have to really do your best to find out what he's all about. Now, it says here, Al titchaber la rasha. It doesn't say completely, titrahek mi menos, stay away from him. It only says, don't associate, don't be too close to him. And there's several reasons for this, several explanations. Explanation number one, some commentaries say that if he's not a bad person, all he is is an irreligious person. He doesn't want to keep certain mitzvot. He's a rasha. At some point, you may be a good influence. He sees how you conduct yourself. He sees your Shabbat. He sees your derecheret. He sees what you do. It may, we're not talking about a damra, remember. We're talking about a rasha, which means that he's just not doing everything right according to the Torah. But he's not a bad person. So therefore, it doesn't say, get away from him. No, we don't get away from people like that. But we don't associate with them. We don't get too close either. At some point, uh, there are stories of somebody telling a, another Jew in Tel Aviv, every Shabbat when he saw him going by, and this other Jew was secular and he was washing his car, doing things that are as soon as Shabbat, you know, things that are not right for Shabbat at least. And he would tell him, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Every time he saw him, the guy didn't answer. He was completely secular. He didn't even like, I think, religious people. But he treated him nicely. After, I think, like five years or ten years, I don't know how many years went by, uh, the guy actually finally came over to him. He says, you know what, you've been so consistent. Every single time, you never miss. You always tell me, Shabbat Shalom, you're so nice. Uh, what's your name? Where are you going? They started into a conversation little by little. He invited him to a class. He invited him to pray. He invited him over for Shabbat. They got close and he became more religious as a result of that. So, uh, yeah. Don't, uh, don't stay away completely. You're not, we're not disconnecting from people who don't know any better. On the other hand, the Chazonish was once asked, Zech Tzadik Levracha Chazonish, big rabbi, you know, how could we go to the Knesset? How could we have people, you know, religious people, members of the Knesset in Israel, which, which, is, which is full of some Rashaim, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So he says, you know, it says, Al Tadchaber La Rasha. He says, that's not called chavura. That's not called associating. That's called fighting them. If, we, if our voice would not be heard over there, you know, it would, things would be worse. Here we have a chance to hopefully have our voice heard. So we're fighting there. We're not necessarily associating with them. It appears to be an association. It's not an association. It's a fight. So Artit Khaber al Rasha is just be careful not to do business with him, not to be too close to him because you don't want to share his fate. And you don't want to learn from him too. Both. Well, why would somebody want to be a Khaber of Rasha? He knows he's a Rasha. Why would he want to be his Khaber, his friend, his business partner? Very simple. Because he's doing very well. 
he's doing very well. Matzliach, he's being su- he's successful in his business dealings. He knows how to invest. He knows what he's doing, and he may be very very sharp, and he may have good mazal. That is why it would be tempting to perhaps associate with him, to be close to him. That is why the next point is very important. Don't just overlook the fact that one day he may fall. As, a, as, the, as, a, as we say in Hebrew, the saying, Sof ganav the end of a thief is that he's hanged. He may be, be, he may be getting away with it. For a number of years, he may be successful in what he's doing. But if he's a thief, Sof ganav, the end of a ganav, in the end game, litliya, he will be hanged. He will be caught. Crime, as they say in English, does not pay. Right? In the, in the end, somebody who's, who did something wrong, he gets caught. He may be caught for something else, or whatever, he gets caught and he, he will pay for it. If you look at history, there are many examples of how good people got hurt by associating with the bad, with the bad people. The famous example, I think, of the Midrash is Shevet Reuven. Shevet Reuven, because of their close proximity in, during the time that we were in the desert, in the camping around the Aron, the Shevet Reuven was in close proximity to Korach the Adator, mm-hmm. and as you know, Korach was rebellious, and, and uh, unfortunately lost his life, him and his constituents, same thing happened with Shevet Reuven, a, a good number of good people got hurt as a result of being living in close proximity. Had, it, it did not happen to Shevet Gad or Naftali or Asher. They were not, because they were close, they talked politics. <laughs> and that's what it was all about. It was all politics. And as a result of the bad politics, you know, they're talking, yeah, yeah, you're right, you have a point. Yeah, let's tell Moshe Rabbeinu this, you know, whatever. You know, instigate it. Because they were close. So that's, uh, there's other examples. There's an example of Yehoshaphat, Melech Yehuda, one of the kings, uh, one of the good, better kings, actually, of Israel, of the lower kingdom, Yehuda. Good king, righteous king. In many ways, he was a very, very good person. But he made some mistakes. And some of those mistakes had to do with associating or being friendly to Ahav, Melech Israel, or to Ahaziah, uh, the, the son, you know, of, your, of Ahav, where he should not have been so friendly with them. He should not have associated with them. He, Hashem was upset at him. He got hurt as a result of that. In other words, even though all around he was good, but there were some things that were wrong. You know, there was, the, the Navi says, why did you do that for? Why did you, you go and see him? Uh, or try to somehow cooperate with him. He's off, he's off limits. He should have been off limits to you. You know that he was a, not a good person. Yeah. What if the Russia asks you for help? If he's genuinely in distress and asks for help, are you not, uh, are you not obligated to help him? No. <laughs> you, of course, you can help almost any Jew uh, as much as you can. The Torah even says that you should help your enemy. Your enemy meaning somebody that you dislike. He's not a bad person, but you just happen to dislike him. So there's no isur to help a rasha per se, depending, of course, on what kind of a rasha we're talking about. A wicked, wicked person. Yes. No, oh, that's different. You know, if you if you say, if the person is a wicked and evil person, in many of the things that he does, are, are against the Jewish community. On the contrary, you, if anything, you you hopefully will will get him to stop, directly or indirectly, what he's doing. You're not going to help him. You're not going to help him survive. No. So you, you are right, there are some exceptions, there are some wicked, or I would call them, not wicked, I would say evil people, which is worse than wicked, uh, that uh, do not deserve any help whatsoever. But for the most part, most of the Jewish people, most, many, many, even non-Jewish people, are not wicked, are not such evil people. And you have to be friendly, you have to be helpful, you have to be charitable to non-Jews as well. You know? You have all kinds of people out there. Not everyone is wicked and evil. So depending on the circumstances, depending on what he does and how wicked of a person he is, obviously, if he's a very bad person, you're not going to help him. But if he's just not as religious, he's your brother. Yeah. 
go ahead and help. Okay, now comes the question on how do we know who to be friends with, like you were saying. If you want to know if to befriend someone or not, how do we know? What's a quick way to know? There may not be a sh there may not be a quick way, but there's a small sh there's a shortcut perhaps. Look at their hands. No, no, no. Not everybody can look at the hands. The shortcut is ask him. Tell me who your friends are. Tell me who your friends are, and I will tell you who you are. Right? It's the same with that. Yeah. In many languages, you know. Basically, you want to get to know a person. See who he hangs around with. See who are his friends. Right? And that is how you will have an idea of who he is. Because kol echad olech kol of lemino, as the rabbis tell us, every bird goes to its kind. You're not going to see a raven next to a pigeon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't get along. They're completely different. One is tahor and one is tameh. Right? So everyone with its kind, and that's, that's a pretty good rule that you can judge by. You know, who are his friends? Who are his business partners? Who does he associate with? And of course, once you start investigating what pe other people have to say about him, you can find out a lot of information from all kinds of sources. So that is one way to know. So, don't be tempted, as we said before, because of his success. And in the end, of course, don't give up hope of retribution. What that means is that even though right now he is successful and that is exactly what's leading you on, that is what's tempting you to join him, not so fast. Because means at some point, if you wait long enough, you're patient, you will see that he will not, no longer be as successful. In other words, don't, don't think just because now he is, it will last. Don't let that therefore tempt you. Don't let that mislead you. Just because he's doing it, why can't I do it? He's cheating on his taxes. Why can't I? Some people think like that. No, 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 no. <laughs> you don't know Hashem's Chesh Barov. If something is wrong, it's wrong. Just because he wasn't caught doesn't mean anything. Maybe he has some zechut, some merit. But you try, you'll get caught. Yeah, unfortunately, when we talk about... Uh, it does not necessarily only mean retribution mishamay. It can also mean getting involved inadvertently with the, with, the, with the law. There have been stories. You have to be very careful of somebody being asked to take a suitcase through customs. And he innocently, naively did. He didn't realize that he had had drugs. And they opened it up and they put him in jail. He says, but it's not mine. He says, well, well whose is it? He's somebody else. Well, where is he? He's not there anymore. He was waiting outside to see if he's caught or not. Mm -hmm. It happened in Japan. It happens all the time. It happens. Not just in Japan. It happened. Very, you have to be very careful. Not associating with bad people. Because inadvertently, of course, inadvertently, everything's in Ashamai. Of course, kapara, you can say that. Everything's in Ashamai. But you have to be careful not to associate with them, because inadvertently, let's call it inadvertently, an individual may be caught and may be blamed for something that is really not his doing. All the time. It happens. Just because they check your phone, they check the phone of the guy who's a Rasha. Oh, look at this list of people who are in his phone. They must be, maybe, maybe Rashaim too. Guilty, as they say in English, by association. Now, even though the, the rule of this country is you're innocent until found guilty, but they're going to they're gonna investigate you. They're going to at least give you a hard time. And if they suspect you, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to have to put bail. <laughs> Who knows? A person can get, his life can become complicated if he's around bad people. Very simple. Another idea behind Altitya Eshmina Puranut is that for somebody who is wealthy and comfortable, he shouldn't be concited. He shouldn't feel for some, for a moment, arrogant. He may be easily arrogant and overconfident about his matzav ability situation. Don't think all the goodness that you have now will last. So al puranut, we can look at it in another way. What the rabbis tell us, the pasuk says, Ashra dam mefachet tamid. Fortune is a person who's always concerned. Maybe what he has will not last. 
maybe what he has will no longer be as good as it used to be. be. Don't be a pessimist, obviously. It's not good to be sad, depressed, distressed, and feeling terrible about something that is a possibility in the future. It, it, don't worry about it. It's, 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 it's remote. Who Think positive. Be optimistic. But be also concerned that you're doing things right, that things may not last forever. Be realistic. Again, the word is, is realistic. You know, things may not last, all good things may not last, but in the same way, all bad things will not last either, Bezat Hashem. So if a person is in a bad situation, economics or otherwise, in other words, the other way around too, don't give up hope just because you're going through Puranu through bad times. Things can change. Life is short. Life as the rabbis, as the Pasuk says pretty much, is like a shadow. The shadow of a bird. Shoo, it goes by so quickly. Before you know it, it's over. So even a tzara may be over soon, or a good thing, a simha, good times, may be over. person who was energetic, was strong and healthy, boom, he's paralyzed. Hashem Yishmor, God forbid. Uh, he, he, all of a sudden, what happened? Who knows what happened? Huh? Yeah, everything's in Hashem. A person should, should be very careful not to be overconfident in his good situation. Who knows if it will last? Hopefully it will. And if he's a bad situation, he shouldn't give up hope, but continue to pray and, and hope that Bezat Hashem, one day maybe the situation will change. And things will become better, as they have in the past. So there, there's various lessons to be learned from, from this comment, Alti Tiaesh, don't give up hope, don't give up hope from something bad. In other words, don't be overconfident that it will last. Who knows? Maybe yes, maybe not. Hopefully yes. But if it's something not too good, hope and pray to Hashem that things will, will improve. They say a story. I haven't seen it verified in any of our sources, but it's brought down that David Amelech once asked a jeweler to make him a special ring. Something that, that he could always wear and something that he could always use, something useful too, not just beautiful, something special. So this jeweler consulted with the Shalomo, the son, is smart. Shalomo, what should I do for your father? What kind of a ring? He says, engrave on this ring, Gamze Yavor, this too shall pass. Whenever he's very happy and confident because he's winning at wars and he's doing very well, he would look at the ring and says, well, this may not last forever. Gamzeya Avor, this too will pass. And if he's going through difficult challenges and difficult times, let him look at this ring and it will also remind him, Gamzeya Avor, this will also pass. It's not going to stay around forever. So regardless of the situation where one is in, you should remember, it will pass. Things pass. Okay, next Mishnah. The next two Mishnayot, actually, have to do more with judges. Even though it has to do more with judges, we are judges too. It happens, I'll give you a small introduction, it happens that a father comes home and one son or one child tells him, he hit me! And you're so upset, you go over to that child and you spank him. Wait a minute, why didn't you hear his story first? you would have found out, perhaps, that he started it. <laughs> right? You have to be... A, a, we are judges all the time. We are asked to judge all kinds of situations, as parents, as friends, as... Right? As individuals. We're judges too. So we have to be careful in judging. Here, the Mishnah is more, mostly geared towards judges in a Beddin kind of a situation. And there's a lot of things that the judges as good as they may be, as learned, as smart as they may be, they have to be aware of certain things. And you will see how this Mishnah also follows the Mishnayot that we just learned. Was we received some information, and now that information will help us understand this Mishnah. Mishnah Chet. Yehuda ben Tabai ve Shimon ben Shatach kiblu mehem, the next generation, Yehuda ben Tabai omer al-tas asmecha ke orchea dayanin, don't play lawyer. Orchea Dayanim means those who help the litigants to present their arguments before the judges. You're a judge, you don't help them out. That's not your job. It's not your job to help them 
argue their case. What's going on over here? We've learned before how it's important to judge people favorably to give them the benefit of the doubt, right? After all, what we see is not always the truth. What we hear is not necessarily what's going on. You have to really look into the matter, ask if necessary to arrive at the truth. In the meantime, give people the benefit of the doubt. However, big however, if you're in court, your job is a little bit different. You cannot just give the benefit of the doubt. You have to make certain assumptions. It is possible that this man that you know from the community as being righteous, Shomer Shabbat, keeps kosher, is a rasha too. You may never have known that. But in business, he may be crooked. So therefore, don't judge by appearances. Don't go based on what you know. You're going to have to investigate. You're going to have to do some research. You're going to have to check out the witnesses. You're, going to, you're not going to be so easy on them. You don't want to help them because you want to be fair. You, if you're a Dayan, you want this case to be fair. You want the, the emit, the truth to come out. So therefore, you have to be careful with not saying anything that may, may uh, jeopardize, that's the word, the whole case. Don't help them out. There are many, many halachot in Hosha Mishpat of what the Yanim have to be careful with. For example, don't listen to one side before you listen to the other side. He comes and tells you, Skate, you know what he did to me? You know what he did? You hear Skate, wow, really? Could that be? Yeah, come to court tomorrow. I'll hear your case. You already have built an impression based on what this individual told you. It may have already biased the judge in a way that he will not be able to fairly adjudicate the case. Listen to the two ta'anot, to the two cases opposing sides at the same time. You have to be fair. Rabbis tell us, therefore, even though you know this person to be honest or good and, and, and righteous, but kabdeo vechashdeo. Be respectful of him, but be suspicious. You never know until you actually investigate it. After all, there are good people and bad people. I mean, and we don't, like you were saying, I mean, do we really know? No, sometimes you get to see it in all kinds of situations that present themselves. Oh, I didn't know he was such a temperamental person. <laughs> all of a sudden, he has a big mouth, you know? Well, because it's, we talk about money, and that's very dear to him, <laughs> money. Another interesting idea about being a judge, being a lawyer, is that it's not only a matter of helping the Baaledin, the ones who are coming to, to seek our help. An individual himself has to be careful with himself because a man, a, a human being, has a big lawyer in his brain. And that lawyer justifies things, interprets things how he or she wishes. Man is not always objective when it comes to himself. So therefore, a person really has to be careful. If he, in fact, knows himself to have committed a wrong, just be regretful. Do teshuvah. Say, I'm sorry. Try to correct it. Don't try to find justifications. Well, I didn't really mean it that way. I didn't do it this way. I, uh, right? All kinds of ways to justify. That's normal. That's natural for many people to do. Husband or wife, or any situation. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Just you're a human being. You, we make mistakes. Just start all over again. Fix it. There, there may be an excuse for having made a mistake, but there's no excuse for not fixing it, for not saying, I'm sorry. I mean, what's the excuse for that? But what happens in the real, in the real world? People try to justify it and, and get away with it. Don't try to get away with it. Just face the reality and, and show remorse. So here the judges have a big responsibility to figure out the truth, and that's not easy. How are they going to know the truth? They're both saying something completely different. There's no documentation. They may not even be witnesses. To know the truth, to be able to resolve a dispute properly, one requires, of course, some experience, chokhmah, wisdom, to be able to see through things. Uh, but people forget that the most important 
condition or the most important asset that a judge uh, should have that will help him figure out the truth is siyatat ishmaya, divine help, divine assistance. Hashem should help. <laughs> that we should be able to figure out and catch the liar. Otherwise, how do you know? You have to be very, very smart, of course. Uh, you have to be experienced, hopefully. Experience does help. And you have to be familiar, hopefully, with the details of, the, of this case as much as possible. But still, siyatat ishmaya. So how do you get a siyatat ishmaya? How do you get divine assistance? Rabbis tell us the facts are very, very black and white. A judge only has what his eyes can see. Judges can make mistakes. Because all he goes by is by what his eyes see. But he doesn't see everything. Therefore, what? If a judge made a mistake, don't worry. Why? Because even if he made a mistake, Hamishpat, the Torah says, Hamishpat lelokimu. The Mishpat belongs to God. The Mishpat belongs to God. In other words, if he made a mistake, he will restore you the money. Somehow you'll get the money from some ant that left your inheritance. Here you lost, you'll get it back. You have to remember that whatever Hashem wants, that's what's going to happen at some point. So maybe in court things go wrong. Your lawyer, oh, the lawyer messed that up. Don't worry. If he messed it up and you were not meant to lose your case, you're gonna, things are going to work out somehow, if Hashem wants it differently. So in the end, Hashem fixes. Hashem says, but I don't want to fix, I want the judge to do a good job. Don't give me the job, therefore you do your job right. So how does a judge going to do the job right? He's going to do it to Hashem Shammai. If he does it for the sake of heaven, if he does it not for his own gain, if he's really careful, he follows the halacha, does everything 100% right, he does not have to fear that things will go, won't go wrong. But hopefully, Hashem will put it in his mind and in the mind of the other judges, the right solution for this case. But if the judges are not 100% sincere, they're not 100% righteous, they're not 100% doing things correctly, then things can go wrong very easily. And they're going to be to blame. And eventually, Bashamayim, they will be accused of doing things wrong. But people don't have to be too concerned about that. I mean, we do our best. We go to bed if necessary, but leave it to him. Yeah. Uh, Rabbi Malach has a psalm where he directly uh, chastises the judges for uh, um, misadverting justice. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. But he says the ramifications are for B'nai Israel in general. Why would that be the case if it's corrupt judges, if it's individual judges that are corrupt, why would the ramifications be for all of B'nai Israel, the entire community? Yeah, good question. Obviously, there have been times in our history where there has been a lot of corruption. Corruption amongst the, the elite, amongst the, the leaders, amongst the judges. So that is a true point. We see the Nevi'im, we see the prophets chastising the, the people, and even the leaders. So the leadership has been definitely at fault many, many times. And the question is, if the leadership is corrupt, why do the people get hurt? The leadership is a reflection of the people. If the president is corrupt, if the Senate is no good, guess what? I have some news to tell you. They represent the people. They are actually a mirror image of what's going on in society. This senator, this congressman, cheated on his wife. He drove while he was drunk. He was caught doing, who knows, terrible things. Guess what? There are a lot of people in society like him. He is a mirror image of what's going on in society. The leadership is not necessarily better than the people. They should be above the standards uh, of the people. In other words, they of course should be even more righteous and more careful and, and, and better people, more learned, obviously. But if you see something wrong amongst them, it's because the people are bad. The people are no good. So it is reflected in the leadership and in the judges. On the other hand, however, on the other hand, it is true that if the judges commit many, many grave sins, such as not judging 
the poor and the orphans. The Torah says, of course, Hashem Yariv et Rivam Hashem is, 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 there's a lot of sensitivity to these kinds of distortions and corruption that the people will suffer as a result. The generation will suffer as a result of lack of justice. So in other words, what that really represents is a type of sin that Hashem is very upset about that affects the entire, all of Am Yisrael. But again, we're going back to question, question number one. Your question is, that why should, but why should Am Yisrael suffer as a result of their Ma'asim? In the end, it's still... It's still because Am Yisrael is not so righteous either. It's just that Hashem will pick on that particular sin to bring about some sort of retribution. In other words, that will stand out. There's a lot of things that are not good probably in society. But what will be the straw that broke the camel's back? What will be the ultimate punishment? It could be that more than anything else, because that Hashem is very sensitive to, that the Torah is very sensitive to that. And that could bring about hunger and war and all kinds of calamities. Because if that, one, if that area is not taken care of, then it's terrible. In other words, even though we said it's somewhat of a reflection of what's going on, but still, the punishment for that will be very severe. So the people are not really being punished for not doing anything wrong. Obviously, there's something wrong because everything is a reflection. But the type of punishment will be more severe, perhaps, in this case, because of what they're doing, even though the people, all they did wrong was of their vodazara, well, idol worship, you know. These guys were corrupt. It could be that that will determine the outcome or the type of retribution. So just, just remember, it is always going to be a reflection. It's not that they are bad and everybody else is an angel. No, that cannot be. How could, we, how could everybody be good? They, it, it's impossible that we should elect such people. They're coming after all. They're coming out from us. Right? It must be, obviously, that there's something going on that's not right amongst the people, even. All right. What's important here also is the right attitude. The judges have to have the right attitude. As the Mishnah goes on to explain, when the litigants are standing before you, you they should appear to you as Rashaim. When they leave you, they should be in your eyes as innocent, as long as, of course, as long as they accepted your judgment. So here, the Mishnah puts an emphasis on attitude. How should we look at these people? How should we approach this whole case? There's a story of a rabbi who once had two litigants in his home, the Reuven and Shimon. Reuven said that what his case was, and rabbi hears him, he says, you know what, Reuven, I think you're right, you have a good point. Now let's hear Shimon. Shimon told his version of the story, and rabbi turns to him, Shimon, I think you're, you're very right. So the rabbi's wife comes in from the back door and says, my husband, how could they both be right? He says, you're also right. You see? <laughs> Everybody's right. You know? Every, that's possible. In other words, no ill feelings towards anyone. The attitude, the approach here should be of equality, of, yes, we're here to serve you, we're here to help you. On the, on, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, you want to be fair, you also want to make an assumption that as much as you may be trusting and you may be thinking that they're nice people, when they first come to court, they should be in your eyes like Rashaim. Why? Well, Rashaim, yes. Why didn't they settle this matter out of court before they came? If they would have been good people, normal, nice, down-to-earth people, why didn't they solve this matter before coming to court? Maybe they're too money-hungry. One or both of them. So think, we're told to judge favorably, here we're all of a sudden told to do the opposite. Now think a little bit negatively. Maybe the two of them are not so righteous after all. Because you want to be fair. In order to be fair, you don't want to be bribed or misguided or misled by your previous good impression of them, if you know them. Oh, I see him every day in the minyan, he comes to nets, 
He has, uh, Baruch Hashem, many guests over. Every Shabbat, his table is full with 30 guests. There are people like that. That could easily influence you. Him? He should be accused of something? Never. Maybe yes. Maybe you don't know about how he does business. Maybe he's money hungry. Right? So therefore, you have to have this attitude of Kabdel Vichajdel, be suspicious that maybe he's not such a good person after all. But once they have left, as long as they accepted the judgment, as long as they accept whatever the rabbis tell them, they should be zakaim. Zakaim means innocent. Why? Don't leave any negative impression from these people in your eyes. They fought, they argued, they yelled at each other, maybe even one of them cursed. Don't let that affect your impression over them. As long as they accept the judgment, because after all, they came to resolve a dispute, to find a solution. So don't have any bad feelings towards them. If they, once they left and they accept it, think of them, because they're both innocent. But what if one was even prepared to swear falsely? And you know he was lying. Still, don't think of him badly. Why? It's very possible that this man who was prepared to swear falsely was in dire straits. He was doing very bad. He was about to be put in jail. He was about to lose his house. He was in a very bad situation. And he was unfortunately desperate. That's why he was prepared to do it. Rabbi Stelz in the Gemara, Hamodeh Bimiktsat, one who admits 50% partially, has to swear. We make him swear. What's one? Shimon owes me $100. You know, he's telling the judges. What does Shimon say? I only owe him 50. He doesn't deny the whole thing. If he denies the whole thing, go prove it. He says, what are you, what is he talking about? I don't owe him any money. I never borrowed any money from him. Oh, and you say he does? Well, prove it. If Shimon says, I owe him 50, not 100, oh. So you do admit you owe, but you don't owe the whole thing. We make you swear. Why do you make him swear? Because people are tempted to deny partially if they're having a problem. Ishtabute kom ishtabe, the rabbis tell us, he's trying to get away with it. He's trying to push it off. He'll pay him eventually, maybe. But there is that possibility in the human nature of trying lithamek, lishtamet, to try to get away from it, and therefore he says, you know what, I owe him 50. Ah, but maybe you really owe him 100, you're just trying to get away with it. You swear. So the rabbis recognize human nature, that it's possible for him to deny but he's a tzaddik, he's a good person, all right, but he's in, he's in a difficult situation. Very important point that I want to stress before we finish here, and we go on to just the last Mishnah, which is a very brief Mishnah. Very, very important for anybody in a situation of hearing litigants is to all, always go out of your way to make a compromise. As long as you did not begin the case and you already know who's right and who's wrong. In the very beginning, always encourage that. Pshara, always a compromise, if it's possible. The reason for that is, as the rabbis tell us in the Gemara, one of the reasons why the Beta Midash was destroyed, the second one, is a Shedan Mutin Torah, because they judged according to the Torah. Wow, you read those words, you're puzzled, you're shocked. What's wrong with that? What's going wrong with opening up a Shulchan Aruch and saying, well, according to this halakha, he is right and he's wrong. Well, guess what happens if you say that? This one is right and this one is wrong. Will those two people ever shake hands and embrace? Forget it. The guy who lost will even hate you as a judge now. Now he has two enemies. Wouldn't it have been better that you make some sort of settlement before the case begins or out of court? Then they would be friends again. Why was the Beta Midash destroyed? Because of Sinat Hinnam, baseless hatred. What kind of baseless hatred? How did that come about? When you don't give a chance for people to compromise, when you try to figure out who's right and who's wrong, which is very nice of you, but it's not so good, you will extend and prolong the enmity, the hatred between people. The mahlokit will remain. So what if you said he's right and he's wrong? You think they'll be friends? They'll say Shabbat Shalom to each other? They'll invite each other for, for weddings? They'll continue to be enemies. They won't like each other. What did you accomplish then? So what? Big deal. So you know the halakha. Always, always try as, as best as possible to figure out a way, if, it's, if possible, to make a settlement. Even though one is more right than the other, okay, maybe. But let him, you know, if you give in a little bit, you're going to be friends again. You know what a good feeling it is? Yes, he may, he may be right, but he, 
he was willing to give in. As long as it's possible. There are situations where it's not possible. The guy owes him the money. <laughs> well, of course, he owes me a thousand dollars. Why should I forgive him half? No, we're not talking about that kind of a case. You owe, he owes you, he owes you. That's up to him if he wants to forgive him. Understand? Uh, talk, I'm talking about compromise when things is, are gray area. Things are not so clear. Yes or no. We don't, we don't know for sure. Try to settle it. Be friends. That is a greater accomplishment than trying to figure out the halakha or, or who is right and who is wrong. Yes? So we should be more like Aaron Akon than Moshe Rabbeinu. Because Moshe Rabbeinu was a, a strict judge. He, was a, he had to be a judge and he was very strict. No, not necessarily. It doesn't say Moshe Rabbeinu didn't try to make compromises. Moshe Rabbeinu taught. He was a teacher. Right? And in the beginning, only in the very beginning, he was judging the people too. Until his father-in-law gave him some good advice. You can't handle the whole load. Give it to judges. And let the judges deal with that. And I'm sure the judges were told, listen, try to make compromise. If it doesn't work, we'll try to figure out who's right and who's wrong. So this advice is not new advice. It existed from the very beginning. It only makes sense that people should try to make a, 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 some sort of compromise. Imagine husband and wife were getting divorced. You know how many millions of dollars go to waste in courts and paying lawyers and, and, and so much aggravation, figure out a way of, of reaching a deal. Make it make a deal. And live happily ever after, even if you're divorced. <laughs> so what? So you didn't get along. But live, you can live a normal life after that. So there's some terrible stories. Always, always aim. Aim for Peshara. Alright, the last Mishnah that we're going to do now is a short Mishnah. Shimon ben Shatah Homer, Shimon ben Shatah, who was the partner of Yudan ben Abayin and Prince Mishnah, was a very interesting person. It's a famous story with Shimon ben Shatah with the donkey or camel that he bought from an Arab. And the students started cleaning up the, the donkey and they found a gem, a big diamond. So the Shimon, you could retire now. <laughs> Look, we, what we found is go give it back to him. I didn't buy his diamond, I only bought his donkey. I only bought his animal. The Arab, as soon as he got the diamond back, began to bless Hashem, Baruch Elokei Israel, the God of the Jews. Look how, look how honest they are. But Akidush Hashem, there was. Shimon Meshada was very, very careful in, the, in, the, in these areas not to mislead people, to be truthful. Very valuable lesson that he taught his students. So this is the Shimon Ben Shatach of that story. This is the same Shimon Ben Shatach that lived during the time when there was big, big trouble with the, with the Sadducees. Who did Sdukim by Tusim, who did not believe in the Torah Shebal Peh, the oral world, who gave the rabbis the Prushim a hard time. They did, not, they did not want to accept the jurisdiction or the authority of the rabbis, that they had the authority to enact decrees, to explain the Torah, to clarify the mitzvot. So, a lot of politics, a lot of trouble with this group of people. And what happens when you have people like that who don't accept the, the validity? of Torah Shabbat Peh, or Bechlal, who have trouble with Torah, can you trust them? You know how many times there were witnesses, I'm sure, in the history of the Jewish people? Witnesses who came and testified, and they were false witnesses. And the Torah speaks about this. The Torah speaks about f falsehood, about Edim Zomemim, about uh, witnesses that, are, that you don't know for sure if they're telling the truth or not. What do you do? The Torah is telling us that we can rely on two witnesses. We need proof. There is no documentation. Witnesses count, and they count for a lot of things. This woman is stuck. This woman whose husband disappeared did not come back from a trip from war. Maybe he died. Maybe he didn't die. Maybe he just ran away. Maybe he's hiding somewhere. Who knows? Maybe he got married to someone else. She cannot marry. She's stuck. She's an aguna. Until we find some proof, some information, even, even from one witness in this case, that, you know, he saw him dead. It was for sure him. He gives testimony. These were the signs. These were the indications. I, mean, I can recognize him. There was no doubt in my mind. Look how much testimony is important in Judaism. So here we, we're taking a chance, too, that the, te the testimony is false. So therefore the Mishnah tells us, Shimon B'Shata Homer, Make sure that you you investigate them a lot, not a little bit. You investigate them a lot. Try to find out if they're telling you the truth or not. Check out the details of what they're saying of their story. Maybe they think they saw something, but they didn't really see it. Maybe what they heard 
maybe what they, they know is because of hearsay, what, you know, was they heard from someone else, they didn't actually see it and, and observe it. Right? Vehebezahir bidvarecha, be very careful with your words as you investigate them. Shema mitocham il Maybe they may learn to lie from your words. In other words, if you volunteer too much information, if you're not careful with your words, they may use it against you. They may use it to their favor. So when you're investigating, we don't have a polygraph machine here. We don't really know 100% if they're saying the truth. You want to really, really do an intensive job to figure out if they're in fact saying the truth. So much depends on them. You don't want to advise them. You don't want to... to uh, to fall in, you know, in a trap, in other words, where they're actually going to use something that they, you taught them, you know, to destroy the case. It, it also means something else. When, when the judge is told to be careful, he's also being told to be careful in the way he handles himself at home in business affairs. As, the, as, the, as it is told in the Gemara, there was a rabbi who had a case come to him where one was suing his neighbor because the neighbor's tree was trespassing. In other words, it was growing into the, his, his, his yard. And he wants, to, he wants to cut off the branches. If not, I don't know, unless he cuts it, he'll cut it. No. And that's a, that's a simple case. I mean, you're not allowed to have that, you know, unless the other one doesn't mind. You know, will you let me pick your mangoes and avocados if they're hanging on my set? I'm sure he won't mind, maybe. But otherwise, it's, it, it takes away space. That was the case. So before he, he resolved the case, he sent his goodbye. He sent uh, the helper of the betting, please do me a favor, go to my yard and cut my tree. The branches are sticking out in the street, public area. All right, he did that. So he came, he, he's now ready to deal with the case. Reuven complains about Shimon's tree. The rabbi tells Shimon, listen, Shimon, Reuven is right. Your tree is hanging over into his yard. Go ahead and cut it. He said, but rabbi, your own tree is hanging over to the, to the public area in the street. How could you tell me to do what you're doing? He says, I don't know what you're talking about. Go check out my tree. <laughs> of course, he waited to check out. Oh, I guess it's gone. Yeah, if you're going to say something, you better live up to it. Yeah. You <laughs> practice what you preach. Right, so have a zahir bit varecha, be very careful with your words so they shouldn't learn that it's okay. They shouldn't learn something that, of course, will, will, will ruin the case. You, you want the case to come out right, so you have to be very careful when you investigate it, when you, when you try to get all the details, when you get to the bottom of it, that they're in fact saying exactly what they observed. Okay, I think, the, I think the only thing we should add here that, that perhaps is a little bit related to this Mishnah is about testimony. How Judaism depends on a lot of testimony. What testimony do we have that we received the Torah in Sinai? Our forefathers, our parents, our grandparents, they believe that they are the witnesses. We were all witnesses, 600,000 witnesses in Matan Torah. Many years have passed. What's unique about Judaism is that it's based on real testimony. It's not that somebody had a dream that some, some, some god or some prophet came to him and told him about, you know, a revelation or a vision. No. It's based on testimony. It's based on real witnesses that would not lie to their children, would not make them take upon themselves such, a, such an incredible uh, yoke of mitzvot unless they actually experienced and saw something. So this testimony is a very, very important part of Jewish tradition, that we actually know it, believe it, and rely on those witnesses. Every Jew, therefore, should take an opportunity at some time in, during his life to investigate these witnesses, to look into this testimony, to learn the Torah, to read what the rabbis have to say, and to convince himself, not just by blind faith, which is also important to have him now, of course, but to actually feel good about this. This actually makes sense. This is not just Baba Mises, what I've told fairy tales. This is actually the truth. This is actually something that happened years ago. This is something that is, is true as we're speaking. Because this testimony, I'm able to verify. Judaism is the only religion where what it claims, for the most part, can be verified. Not everything may be scientific 
That's because we don't have all the tools. And science doesn't have all the tools to verify certain things. It's just not verifiable in a laboratory. But basically, if you look at the whole picture, the whole history, at the mitzvot, at the whole tradition, how it's handed over, and how accurate it was kept, you see the reliability of this. It stands. If in a court they're going to accept the testimony of two guys coming from the street and saying, we saw this happen. Two guys. We shouldn't accept it. The testimony of 600,000 people, of millions of Jews who are willing to give their life for this? So obviously with a little bit of common sense, a little bit of reading our history, our Tanakh, our Torah, our Gemara, our Midrashim, the Zohar, just becoming more knowledgeable with what our tradition has to say, Bezat Hashem, we will be convinced, and that Bezat Hashem will also strengthen our Muna. Thank you.